survival is important. Uh, freedom from revascularization isn't on their um, list. It's like uh, pulling teeth. You, you know, do you want them all out at once? Now you surely never need another dental procedure. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we can put in stents, we can do it uh, as many times as you like. It's not a problem. So, and the patients don't have this huge issue about repeat revascularization. His patient had a failure of medical therapy, for sure. Um, uh, the stents were fine, as you saw. Um, but he's a diabetic. Uh, and uh, uh, failed medical therapy. One other uh, point of order, I guess. Wires are not going to cause distal disease like that. Uh, they don't. And the possible subtle suggestion that the catheter in the left main causes left main disease um, may have gone, or maybe it was meant to be that, but uh, they don't. Um, but do you see patients with de novo left main lesions early after a PCI? We uh, never see it <laughs> in, in, in any, in any know, time frame. The, the, only, oh, no. the only time we see it is when you stick uh, a cannula in during aortic valve surgery. Uh. Like that. <laughs> no, 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 but that's not true, Peter. I mean, in, there are cases where there was no left main disease before, and after an angioplasty of a distal LAD or what have you, there is a later left main lesion almost certainly due uh, from dissection of a guide. It does happen. It's not common, but it can happen. Well, I, I, I you know, of course. You know. <laughs> are, are you going to deny that it never happened? Uh, I'm not sure. It's, uh, fortunately, I don't follow them up. So, uh, well, you know, no, it's never happened in my. I have, and I've seen them. I, I also want to it bring does up happen. I also want to bring up uh, one of Peter's cases, and, and again, I give him kudos because he's got a sensible head on his shoulders and he stopped. So he, he showed you that uh, acute STEMI where he, he dilated and stented the proximal LED, did the IVIS and showed a tremendous amount of disease distally, and didn't do what probably three quarters of the interventionalists around the world would do, especially in certain places in Europe and Korea, and that is stent the entire LED. He stopped, he saved the patient's life, he did what was ne necessary to alleviate their symptoms pro and improve their prognosis, but he left them with a future option. And unfortunately, Terry and I can attest to this, we see too many patients who come to us where the entire LED has been stented from stent to sturm, they've had instant restenosis, and there's nothing we can offer them because we're, we're bypassing, if anything, the distal apex, which does nothing for them. So the kudo is to, is to stop and give the patient an alternative down the road. So as long as you tell the patient we're going to try stenting now and we're going to leave surgery as an option down the road, I have no problem with that. It's when things progress and oh, the first stent failed, I'm going to put a second stent in and, and now I've got a distal dissection, now I've got to put a third and fourth stent in and, and you're fine as long as all four of your stents are open, but if you're not, surgery's not an option either and, and that's where I start. The problem is you can't stop sometimes. You start, you start in the mid-LED and you put a stent in and you get a dissection and the distal parts, you could put another one in, and then you put another one in, and then before you know it, you have stented the entire LED. So, I mean, there are patients that should not have an, even an attempt at a PCI. They should go for surgery immediately, or as their first option. It's when they are inappropriately angioplasty where problems occur, and where the patient puts pressure on. No, I agree with you, but I think, you know, there, there are patients who on the diagnostic you can predict they're going to at least need at least three or four stents in that LAD to adequately address their lesions, and I think they should be put forth for surgery. Uh, no, everybody, whether they're surgery or PCI, you're going to have complications, and you have to deal with the complication that's in front of you. And I'm not arguing against that. Um, but you know, if you can predict that this person's going to have an issue, and, and I'll bring up the other case that I had. So a lot of the people at my table are saying, why is that patient not going for surgery with that very ugly looking left main and the aneurysm? And you did a beautiful job, and, and I wasn't there, and I don't know the, the details as to why you know, it was a, a higher surgical risk. But one of the things that I'm sure the surgeon who was involved in was thinking about is if, when that patient, and if that patient comes back in three or four years with aortic insufficiency and now a six meter root, that left main stent causes us issues. It, it becomes tremendously more technically challenging for us to repair that root and work around that left main stent without giving them 
bypass graphs to deal with. Whereas, you know, de novo up front, uh, a native coronary button into a graft uh, has reasonably good prognosis. So I, I think, you know, in, in all things, it's, it's what you can do and compare that to what you should do and not just think about what's going to happen in the first 30 days after your intervention, but what does that leave the patient with down the road and how does that implicate potential therapy down the road? And, and we deal with that all the time. You know, patients come to us saying we need to have orthopedic surgery or they need to have a cancer resection, um, but they've got coronary disease. And we talk about, you know, if we put a stent in, they have to be on Plavix and that's going to complicate their cancer surgery, so maybe surgery is the best way to go. So we do that discussion all the time and, and I think it's important to realize that that's where the subtleties of the unique patient factors and preferences do come into play. So I knew asking that question it would be like throwing a little pebble at the top of a snow-covered mountain. By the end, it would just be this huge boulder. That's, so that's very good. Thank you very much. Uh, some other questions. Um, should people have a simple uh, echo or a simple uh, PMIBI, or should, is a dobutamine stress echo the most useful screening test? Uh, I think stress echocardiography uh, done well is, is extremely good. The, you will see wall motion abnormality on echo very early before symptoms and before ECG changes. So it's there, and if it's ischemic, uh, you will see it. Uh, you don't get radiation uh, to do it, and that may be addressed in the talk on what's the risk of radiation. but. Uh, uh, a stress echo will give you a lot of information and uh, done well will uh, tease out the target, the uh, region that's uh, ischemic. I think it's very good. So I think we will see more of them uh, over time, um, mm -hmm. particularly from good labs. The butamine echo, I haven't seen very many, but it has the advantage of having uh, the patient in exactly the same position as when the ischemia occurs. Part of the problem with doing stress echoes mm -hmm. is you have to stop and then move the patient onto a bed, get him in the right position, and then of course his heart rate goes down precipitously and you're missing the time, possibly with the most ischemia, whereas with dibutamine, you're there, it's happening at the same time, patient is still, the images are good. So I think there are some advantages sure. to dibutamine echo. Okay, um, I'm reading directly now. As a family doctor, my opinion, is that the patients are not being explained the benefits of surgery versus PCI by the cardiologists or cardiac surgeons. Please comment. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't write that one. I agree with you, and I think that's why we're moving to this new approach where every patient is going to have an opinion from a surgeon, an interventionalist, and a non-interventionalist, because sometimes <laughs> medical therapy is the right thing to do. So I, I'm reminded of if any of you are I, fans I, of Saturday Night Live and you used to see point counterpoint and it used to start with Jane, you ignorant, I'm leaving out the last word. I was waiting for that, but go ahead. Uh, it's a very important discussion you, you have to have with the patient. And uh, unfortunately, I, I think that uh, the more we see patients sent to us for advice rather than with preconceived ideas, the better, because they come saying, you know, why can't I have the angioplasty? And you're saying it, the, the anatomy is, uh, is best treated by surgery. And they didn't, really aren't interested in hearing it until you keep repeating it, and perhaps their wife's there too, and you keep repeating. But if they're undifferentiated when they come to you, it's a much easier conversation to focus on the anatomy and the patient factors, uh, and then say, well, speak to the surgeon. Part of our problem is that they're so damn difficult to get. The surgeons, you know, you, you say, look, you can go home now, but if you wait eight hours, you can see a surgeon, or he might see you at 8 a.m. in the morning. So we're getting through these uh, teething issues, but uh, I keep them until they've met a surgeon and, and made a decision, because I think that uh, they have an opportunity to see me again, but it's a bit inefficient right now. So that's the whole point of this trial, where we'll have the cardiologists and the cardiac surgeons collaborating to make a decision with the sheath still in the patient's uh, arteries. Well, well it's still uh, an, an awfully funny where, uh, situation to make a major decision. I think ad, ad hoc decision making is, is fraught with issues. And how can a patient in that position, he has a, does not have his family beside him, cannot think out the decision clearly 
make a good decision. I, I, I'm concerned about ad hoc decision making and I think you have to be very careful. If there's any way the patient can wait until he's out of the cath lab, home and for uh, a repeat appointment, and the, the person giving them the advice has absolutely no vested interest in the, in the decision that has arrived at. He's not trying to maintain his surgical load or maintain his angioplasty load, that he is an unbiased person. That's the kind of person you want, and educated and experienced. I agree with Len there, and, but you know, and this is surprising coming from me, but I think for your patients as family doctors, I think it's nice to know that if your patient's on the table, and is a potential ad hoc candidate, because the reality is the hospitals like the efficiency of ad hoc PCI, at least knowing the surgeon was there saying, you know what, it is a reasonable approach, a reasonable option to offer this patient PCI. Your patient has had a surgical input, um, whether or not the patient actually met the surgeon, but at least the surgeon was there, reviewed the angiograms, and agreed with the interventionalist that it was an appropriate decision to proceed with PCI in an ad hoc setting. I completely agree with Len. In an ideal world, we'll pick everybody off the table and have a frank discussion with the cons and, and the benefits of surgery versus PCI. But in reality, you know, the majority of patients, you saw the slides, that come to us have good target vessels that Peter can do a lot of magic with. And I wouldn't object for, you know, if it was me on the table with an LAD lesion that he could stand very quickly, absolutely. But if I have triple vessel disease, and, and, and maybe one thing that Peter can comment about, I find all of his colleagues have different thresholds. As a surgeon, my threshold is three stents. So if I need more than three stents, I want a surgeon to have an input. Um, some of his colleagues say five or six. I don't know what your number is, Peter. But, um, you know, there, there should be some type of upper number where, you know, once you hit, you know, now I'm not talking about complications. I'm talking about in order to adequately revascularize you a priori after your diagnostic angiogram, you're going to need four stents. Well, I think a surgeon needs to have an input at that point. I, I don't think there's a, a, a number of stents that cuts in or out. For me, it's always, um, can I do a really nice job with a, the smallest number of stents, but can I do a really nice job on this or not? And uh, uh, the, part of the problem with prescribing, um, you know, a number of stents or three vessel disease, three vessel can have three short lesions and they're gonna be fantastic. So the rules, uh, can't be written that way, which is why you need uh, discussion. But I am uh, totally in agreement with Len. Uh, ad hoc is generally hurried with less uh, discussion. The patient is usually sedated, so they're not really making a decision. Um, and if they are stable patients where discussion should be had, I take them off the table. If they're unstable, and there's for sure advantage to uh, stenting the culprit lesion, um, we should have discussion or possibly limit your procedure to that vessel um, and uh, readdress what you're going to be doing. I think the overall idea of the program is to make sure that there's input from both uh, interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery into decision making. And where it's appropriate, if time allows, certainly you take the patient off the table and then you can have a discussion after the fact. But in those cases where it may not be appropriate or they want it, you want to proceed, having that interaction, uh, two heads better than one. Um, next question, what's the optimal long-term follow-up after cabbage other than optimal medical management? Is it an annual echo? And at what point do you repeat an angiogram? For me, um, I, I tend to have the patients go back to their cardiologist after I see them for surgical issues for about two months. Um, and it's interesting because I do keep in touch with a lot of my cabbage patients and every cardiologist sort of has a, a different philosophy. I find that the younger patients who present with asymptomatic disease undergo routine annual uh, testing, whether it's stress testing or Im imaging. I think the patients who presented with symptoms, um, if they're asymptomatic, they're follow <coughs> clinical. I'd be interested to see what Peter and Len do in their practice. You know, the, the guidelines uh, discourage routine stress testing after cabbage, I'm sure of it, and after PCI as well. And uh, to, re to do testing only with symptoms, uh, I think at five years the break occurs and then you can begin to do routine testing. But I think the American and I believe Canadian guidelines discourage routine testing. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And. Uh, in that sense, then, I would seriously discourage, discourage annual nuclear testing uh, because, you know, 10 years later, you've had 10 nuclear stress tests and they're all 
satisfactory and you know now you're in trouble because you had symptoms that's what uh, you, you had a normal stress test three months earlier and now you're here with symptoms um, so uh, I think you can avoid it it is absolutely risk factor reduction and uh, exercise um, exercise limitation is is tough to uh, if the patient is limited for orthopedic or other reasons but if they are exercising um, uh, and they have deterioration in exercise tolerance. Now you've got something to reassess. If they're doing well, they're doing their hills, they're doing their walk, uh, you've got as much information as you need um, over time. But we all see the patients, um, and I'll give you an example, a 50-year-old diabetic who's exercising regularly, just comes in for his annual physical, has a stress test as part of that, and it's abnormal, and one thing leads to another, and he has bypass surgery. So how do you screen that patient because they never presented with any symptoms and they were that's, exercising a lot. That's the <laughs> oculo bypass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next well, question. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, it's not, it's not going to be a perfect. Uh, yeah. you, you will have to use a lot of common sense in your screen. But I, I think that, uh, honestly, uh, many tests are done unnecessarily on an annual basis. Terry, question about the uh, stem cells. Um, are you doing an MRI to determine the uh, viability in the region where the cells are injected uh, before and then subsequently so you can tell how if there has been some improvement in viability? Yep, absolutely. So these patients, as you might imagine, are being studied up the wazoo. So with uh, <laughs> Bern and Andrew, and uh, you know, they're, they're the experts in cardiac MRI. And so these patients, we are looking uh, very precisely, not only at the whole heart, but at the area of the infarct and where we're going to be putting those cells. Like, so we're looking at perfusion, we're looking at function, we're looking at viability. Um, and it's a difficult process sometimes to tease out the effects of some additional therapy, like the cells, on those kinds of parameters when we know that you know, these are patients who have coronary artery disease. Bypass surgery alone does a lot of things and a lot of good things. Um, but to try and demonstrate that the cells are doing something over and above that requires some very, very careful uh, assessment. Um, so fortunately, like, you know, in a place like this, like, you know, no matter what issue it is, whether it is you know, uh, how to assess that patient's heart afterwards or how to sort of, you know, look at them by echo or how to sort of isolate the cells and do those things, the good thing is that you know, I've got a bunch of people who actually are world experts on those various things. So, you know, as I say, I can solve more problems by running into somebody at the coffee line at Tim's than I could <laughs> by banging my head against a problem for six months by myself. So, so uh, you know, as you saw, there's a long list of people who are involved in this kind of thing, and without, uh, without all that expertise, this stuff doesn't happen. So there's multiple other questions. I know it's the end of the session, but I cannot, uh, I just have to read this one and uh, seek the answer. For uh, Len, Len, what is the legal risk of not doing an angiogram in the second case that you set, that you showed, especially when the patient seeks a second opinion with a cardiologist who then does an angiogram and does find that there were lesions that you didn't find by doing, not doing an angiogram? What about if the second cardiologist does it and has a complication from doing it? Um, I think that there's pretty good data, data that if... Uh, a patient can reach, I think he reached almost 12 minutes without ischemia, without any acceleration in symptoms, and with excellent risk factor support and modification and control, that there is no indication for coronary angiography. End of sentence. Thank you very much. I think that was a fantastic panel discussion. I appreciate all the forthright comments. So we're going to move uh, right on to the next session, which will be chaired by Dr. Bernd Wintersberg, um, head of uh, cardiac MR at University Health Network. Bernd.